Gregory Kershaw, co-director of The Truffle Hunter. Uh, this film is about a world that I don't think many people know about. I definitely didn't. Um, old Italian men uh, looking mm. for truffles with dogs. <laughs> so when did you first learn about truffle hunters? Well, um, so me, me and my partner, Michael Dweck, who, um, who's he's usually on these things with me, but he isn't here today. And um, we're, we're both obsessed with, with finding worlds that, that exist outside of this modern world of digital technology and globalized culture that, that most of us spend our days in. We're, we're, we're interested in finding places that have held on to their connection to the past, have held on to their, their local cultural identities, have held on to their relationship with, relationships with nature. And um, we actually, we, we both kind of stumbled upon this world by chance. Um, it was the summer after we finished our previous film together, The Last Race. And, and we both ended up separately in this very same part of Italy where we ended up making the film. We actually ended up in the exact same villages. And, it, and we were there about a month apart from each other. Um, and we were finishing the color correction on our previous film. And we were actually standing on a corner in New York City. And we were just, we were talking about this place. And we were, we were drawn to it because it, it felt different from a lot of other places that we'd experienced. It felt, you know, we, it, well, it felt like a, kind of a fairy tale to us. It felt like well, while we were there, it, it felt like we had kind of stepped back in time. And then we had heard these rumors of these truffle hunters that went out in the middle of the night. And we were there during the summer and it wasn't truffle season, but people said, you know, you should, you should come back in the fall. That's when the truffles come. And, and we, no one really, no one knew anything about this culture. Everything about it was a secret. But that was, that was enough to, for us to kind of finish this conversation and say, we, we, we have to go back. And so we, we went back that fall at the very beginning of truffle season. And we started, we started trying to, to learn, well, who these truffle hunters were, what it actually was. And it led us onto a journey that took us, well, three years into, into making this film and slowly entering into this, this very secret culture, the secret almost society of, of people who spend their, usually old men who spend their nights in the woods alone with their dogs, searching for eight to 12 hours in the cold darkness, searching for, for these truffles, this, this elusive, this elusive ingredient, the most expensive in the ingredient in the world that it can't be cultivated and it can only be found by this kind of like this, this magic that occurs when these hunters have this, 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 knowledge passed down through generations and these dogs and they, they alone can find it. Mm -hmm. I love how mysterious it is. It's like it's rumors and like no one's ever seen them. They only come out at night. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it took, you know, just to meet the truffle hunters, the film took three years to make. And like the first year was really just trying to, to first get into the, the communities where we wanted to film and start meeting people and make friends. But we weren't, we weren't even meeting the, tr the truffle hunters. I mean, that took us, it took us a year to, to build relationships with the communities and start, you know, ask, we started asking around. We said, well, you know, could, we went to like the local trattoria that had truffles every day. And we said, could you introduce us to the truffle hunter who you get truffles from every day that's on your menu? And he said, I, I've never met the guy. I just, I just, I just leave some money in a box outside, and then and the next morning a truffle appears. And he said, "Okay." And then he said, "But you know, go ask the priest." And then we would we would talk to the priest, and he'd say, "You know, talk to my cousin." And it was this it was this long process of of building building relationships throughout the community. And then we eventually started meeting the truffle hunters, the, the real truffle hunters, the people who are in our film, and 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 we had to build relationships with them. And I mean, that's where our filmmaking really started. It started with building friendships with the people that we were filming. And luckily we were in a, in a, in a beautiful part of Italy where uh, relationships are built over, over long lunches with, with wine and coffee. So it was, it was, it was, you know, it was, we had a lot of, we had a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> <Dude>. <laughs> yeah, we, we had a lot, we had a lot of fun, but they became, they became our friends and they became, they became, you know, we became kind of their extended family, and we kept coming back, and we kept spending time there. And and I think they they slowly realized that they we were serious about this film, and they realized 
why we were making this film, I think they realized like that they're that what they have in their world is is they have something that's very special and it's very rare in the world. And I think they wanted to share it with people. So they 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 invited us in and we showed them what we were filming and I think they invited us in more and they take start taking us out in, in the in into the woods with them. Um and we we'd spend you know evenings well chasing them through the woods with their cameras. We could never keep up with them. Um, they really put us through they our ran you. <laughs> like, <laughs> they, they, Well, you guys have cameras, so. Yeah, Car Carlo, who's 88. I mean, we would be, he's, we would be in the middle of the night, we'd be struggling to keep up with him in the middle, in the woods. I mean, he, he says in the film, he's I'm faster than the deer and he, he, he really is. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a sequence where you, I am assuming you attach a camera onto one of their dogs because it's shot from the dog POV. <laughs> so yeah, what 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 did that entail? Well, so I mean, we when we when we started learning about what truffle hunting was, and we started understanding the the, the lives of the truffle hunters, we realized that the dogs were were an essential part of the story. And I mean, in, in 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 a lot of cases, these truffle hunters, the the, re, the closest relationship they have in the world is with their dog. I mean, Aurelio and Berba, he 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 eats dinner with his dog at the table. They they eat out of the same bowl. I mean, he taught he he has these long one sided conversations with his dog. But it, although it sometimes it sometimes seems like she understands a little bit of what he was, he's saying, but we realized like the, their dogs are. Are, had to be a character, and we wanted a way of representing their their perspective in the world because we we kind of we had the human perspective, which was you know very we tried to create these very painterly, com deliberately composed images, but we wanted something to contrast that the the, the frenetic feel of a dog running through the woods and ex experiencing nature speeding by, and this this thrill and the frenzy of the hunt of digging out a truffle from, from the earth and this kind of, this just kind of insane burst of excitement that comes from both the dog and, and the truffle hunter. And we, we started experimenting with different ways to get the dog's perspective. And well, at first we tried chasing the dogs around the woods with a camera, which we, there was no way we were going to keep up with them. So we, we quickly, we quickly abandoned that. And then we, we started, trying to come up with a rig that would allow us to get a dog's point of view. And we, we found all these like complicated rigs that were like miniature steady cams. And we've got these very advanced harnesses that we put on a dog's back and these tiny steady cams. And it, it, none of it worked. It, it looked like you were kind of floating above the dog. And then, well, we, we realized that we had a, a shoe cobbler right staying underneath us in the town where we were where we were living and we we went down and we said well we want to do this thing where we mount a small like a gopro camera onto a dog's head and to get to get a dog's perspective shot because that's really what what we what we needed and he he said sure come back tomorrow we gave him some we gave him some measurements for a dog's head and he he, he had a harness and put a gopro on it and um we sent a dog out into the woods with a truffle hunter and um, the truffle hunter came back three hours later and the camera was gone. But, um, <laughs> but we, 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 we quickly, we started refining, we started refining the rig and um, it, uh, eventually we found, we, we developed different, different mount, different rigs, different mounts for the, for each of the dogs that we were filming with. And it, the footage that we got was so amazing because we would let it roll for, you, you know, they were GoPro cameras, so they would roll for like like three hours, sometimes more, and they, they would just go into the woods and go truffle hunting. And then we would come back and we would we would see this, some of the footage is just incredibly beautiful. It's like hypnotic watching the dogs run through the woods. But then there were these other moments where we, we would see things about the relationships between our characters and the dogs, like Aurelio and Berber. That's when we first realized like this, he has, he really talks to his dog. He, he confides, how he's feeling and his secrets to the dog and his concerns and cares. And then we also saw that like, he, he was, he was saying words that, that we didn't understand. So they weren't, they weren't in Italian Piedmontese, the, the, the local dialect. And we realized that, that all the truffle hunters, they, they developed their own language of commands with each of their dogs. And it's just by, I mean, it's because they spend so much time with them alone in their woods. They have this whole unique set of commands that no one else would understand, but they, that it's this, special thing that that holds them together and all that was 
you know, discovered through through this this camera. And we also got to see, I think, some of the secret spots that they would never <laughs> never really <laughs> very <laughs> very <laughs> yeah. well, well, that's one of the things is because like they're it, they're very charming. Their story is very charming. The relationship with the dogs is very charming. But they get very serious when it comes to truffle hunting, and then they you know rail against these like young hunters who don't who are just in it for the money you know and like dogs get killed and then there's this whole other aspect with how it's kind of like a dying art because of climate change and like agricultural yeah. pollution and everything um so how much of that like going into it like or, or over the three years like what what did you observe about um how cli uh, climate change and all this other stuff has affected truffle hunting yeah so i mean they're they're the truffle hunting in the in the region has become it's become so incredibly competitive, and that's that's why in the film there, there's a, a dog one of, one of our truffle hunters his his dog is is poisoned, and they're poisoned because the the value of truffles it's uh, sometimes they can sell for almost as much as gold per kilogram. I mean that truffle that that is in the auction in the film it's close to two kilos and it sells for a hundred thousand dollars. I mean so the 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 prices are, it's just kind of mind boggling. And this is, this is, you know, it's a, a fungus that will in three days, you won't be able to eat it. I mean, it's, it's, it's mind boggling. And there's this incredible absurdity to this, this, this whole world of the truffle consumption. But the, the reason that they're so expensive is, well, because first the, it's climate change and, and these truffles, they can't be cultivated. The white truffle can only grow in this very, thin strip of land that runs mostly through Italy and some of the neighboring countries. And it depends on these incredibly specific conditions that this land provides and the local climate provides. And as the climate, the global climate, the local weather changes, every year there, there are fewer and fewer truffles. Like Carlo, who's 88, he would, he would tell us this story about how when he was a kid, he would follow his father as he was plowing the fields. And a truffles would sometimes pop up. And he it would pick them up almost, you know, like potatoes. And, and and I mean, it's unthinkable that something would happen like that today. I mean, finding a truffle, it, it, it's impossible. It's like finding gold. And and the at the same time, there's deforestation that's happening in the region. Forests that produce the truffles are getting cut down. Um, a, a lot of it is for the region produces great wine, which uh, which which I which I drank while I was filming and enjoyed very much. But it it. It, it, they're cutting down forests to make these vineyards that look beautiful, but but they're taking the place of of what was once these truffle forests that the the people we were filming depend on. And now, as all of that is happening, the demand for truffles around the world is going through the roof. It used to be just something that was a local delicacy, and then it kind of spread throughout Europe. and And now they, we want them in America and, and China, and and we want them all, all all over the world. So the demand is going up, and the supply is going down. It's just kind of created this situation where where the the, the competition among the people that know how to do it is is grown to extraordinary levels. Mm -hmm. uh, do you like truffles? It's in well, a <laughs> I, what's that? It's an expensive habit. Yeah, I, I, so I never actually had a truffle until I started making this film. I, I, I thought I did. I had had truffle oil, which I think a lot of people have experienced, and and um, I, I quickly learned when we started making this film that that truffle oil, there's actually no truffle in it. It's it's all a synthetic compound that 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 is the same mimics the compound that's found in truffles and the, and the real experience of a, of a white truffle is is there's there, well it's unlike anything else and i think that's why people are so drawn to it and there is this kind of incredibly absurd market around it because there there's something kind of wholly unique about it um and I'll, i guess my the best experience i'll let's say the best experience i ever had had eating a truffle was it was the first year of filming and it was um there was a drought that year and it, it was actually very very unusual that it hadn't rained in in months in that region and the truffles depend they, they need moist ground they need a rain in order to bloom and it hadn't it hadn't rained for like three months and we were going we were out with one of the truffle hunters that we were starting to get to know we were starting to enter into his world and become a friend of his 
And after being out for a few hours, we finally found a truffle. And he was he was overjoyed. His dog was overjoyed. We were overjoyed because we actually got to see what it looks like for a truffle to come out of the ground. And we assumed he was going to immediately call the, the dealer, the truffle dealer in the film, Gian, Gianfranco, who who zips around in his Range Rover and buys truffles from from the truffle hunters. Um, but he didn't. He um, he invited us back to his house, and he he put some wood in his in the wooden fireplace in, in his kitchen. And he took out a, a cast iron pan and he cracked like eight eggs in the pan and he fried them up and he shaved truffle over those eggs. And that he shared that with us. And it was, it was, it was delicious. It was delicious for many reasons. It was because we were exhausted from being out in the cold all night. Um, and, and, you know, the, but more than anything, I guess it was just, it was him inviting us into the world. I think it was kind of our symbolic entry into becoming friends and saying, hey, you can, you can come with me. You can, you can make this film with me. Mm-hmm. A once in a lifetime truffle. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, Greg, it was great speaking with you. Thanks so much for your time.